My name is Susie Cheek. I am Associate Director for Research and Scholarly Communication at the University of Bristol. And I'm also co-convener, along with my colleague Jane Saunders at University of Leeds of RLUK's Collection Strategy Network. Um, I'm very pleased to be chairing this panel, which will be looking at the development of equitable knowledge infrastructures so I'm going to introduce our first speaker, um, who is Dominique Walker. Dominique is the publishing officer for the Scottish Universities Press. Dominique is going to talk to us about how 18 academic libraries from across Scotland have established a not-for-profit publishing infrastructure. And she's going to focus on how library staff involvement is really essential to that SUP collaborative model. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, and hello from incredibly rainy and gloomy Glasgow. Um, so uh, in this talk, I want to provide a, a brief background to the Scottish Universities Press and provide an update on our, our progress to date. But I mainly want to focus on how it's been um, the library staff and library staff involvement um, that's been central to the SCP collaborative model and how we're hoping to kind of foster new skills across the SCURL community that's related to open access uh, publishing. So SUP is a fully open access and not-for-profit publishing press. It's been coordinated through the Scottish Confederation of University Research Libraries, uh, and it is managed by 18 academic libraries that you can see on this slide. So why did SCURL libraries decide to develop their own publishing infrastructure? So it all uh, began with a kind of an emerging shared challenge across our libraries around that transition to open access for research. So you know, as we all know, um, libraries have been very heavily involved in supporting things like the compliance of changing funds to open access policies, supporting REF, managing our repositories, managing changes to subscription models. We've seen rising costs in access to materials, limitations placed on accessing ebook content, high costs of APCs and BPCs, you know, the list is endless. So SCURL libraries do spend around £30 million a year providing access to electronic resources for learning and research. And quite a large amount of that does go to kind of large profit-making commercial publishers. And it's also just a very complex landscape for our researchers. So we saw a clear need for a more equitable, straightforward and, and cost-effective model that would benefit our researchers and our institutions. And we are really keen to explore alternative approaches to academic publishing that are kind of putting the needs of the academic community at the centre. And ultimately, we really want to contribute to all of the, the wider global efforts to create a fairer and more equitable academic publishing model uh, and ecosystem. Uh, so lastly, we wanted to create a Scotland-wide solution. So pooling our resources, working together, rather than each institution starting up their own press. It also allows smaller institutions who may not have the resources to start their own uh, publishing initiative to become involved too. And SCURL has got experience of managing a shared infrastructure. So um, they manage SHEDL, that's the Scottish Higher Education Digital Library. That's a collaborative procurement infrastructure that provides equity of access to digital resources for all Scottish students, staff and researchers, um, regardless of the AHEI um, they are at. So SCURL libraries um, did seem a good fit for developing a shared publishing model. So as a starting point in 2019, we asked our academic community in Scotland what they wanted to happen in this space through consultation. That culminated in a proof of concept report. The report was very favourable towards the idea. So throughout 2020, a partnership was formed between the 18 institutions. And because SCURL has existed for almost 30 years, members do have a very strong background in working together. So there were existing kind of governance infrastructures that allowed us to move forward quite quickly with this. Uh, member libraries agreed to fund the press through a, a banded subscription model, and this covers all of the fixed costs of running a press, such as staff salaries and platform costs, for example. The management board of the press was created in 2021 with a representative from each library, and the project plan was developed. And 2022 really was the year when things got going. We started to work through the project plan. We formed the SCP editorial board, developed our workflows, our financial model and technical infrastructures. And that allowed us to launch our first calls for content in early 2023. So there was no pre-made roadmap of how to do this. We had to ask ourselves lots of questions, things like what are the costs? How can we find out the true costs of publishing? Can we do things differently? How can we better support our researchers? Um, and we did borrow quite heavily from startup culture and entrepreneurial methodolo methodology. 
um, with an emphasis on kind of rapid and concurrent work um, and decisions always guided by the values of SUP. So aiming to be open and transparent and with an eye on that kind of end box of being scalable and also sustainable. So I'll now look at our progress to date. So the first significant milestone I mentioned was the recruitment of the editorial board. That was achieved through an open call to our researchers at, at member institutions. We quickly mobilized this group and um, they developed the peer review um, policy and the editorial workflows. We also finalized our content strategy and our timelines, as well as the financial model. So while we did aim to keep as much of the work within the SCURL network as possible, some skills we did need to outsource to a third party. And those things were very specific things like copy editing and typesetting, because we did find from the proof of concept report that researchers still were very keen to have a high quality, well-designed book. So we sourced a local employee owned book production company, and this allowed us to set our production charge at three and a half to five and a half thousand pounds, including VAT. And this covers all the variable costs of producing the book. And we have been able to keep them low due to the hybrid funding model. So all of this preparatory work provided the foundation for our call for content to be opened in early 2023. The first proposals uh, that we received then progressed through the peer review workflows in the spring and the editorial board then met to review the proposals and the first were accepted for publication. Our first manuscripts were delivered in January of this year and now moving into the production workflow. So as the press develops, we wanted to retain all of the collaborative benefits while also implementing a more formal structure that provides the necessary scope for growth and gives us the legal identity that is required for an operational publisher. So SUP is now established as a community interest company. Um, and this allows us to bring the existing governance structure into that CIC constitution, embedding our not-for-profit status in our operating model moving forwards. And this has been a really major strand of work for us in preparing for the next phase for SGP. So currently we are publishing books and edited collections by um, researchers at participating institutions. However, we are conducting a content strategy review now looking to expand the infrastructure to gather other, other content types, such as textbooks and journals, um, as well as expanding our offer to researchers at all UK institutions. And to support this, we have recruited a commissioning editor who starts the role in April. Uh, and we're now looking forward to publishing our first book in the summer with an official launch event. So please do listen out for announcements. So central to developing our publishing infrastructure has been that sense of shared ownership of working together and developing new skills as information professionals. There's been a focus on working things out ourselves, exploring and questioning to understand what makes us novel. From the start, we've been really keys, keen to use the skills and expertise that is already available across our network. So being SCURL owned and library led as a, a clear identity and an alternative to the profit making publishing models. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, SCURL member libraries have got this very strong background in working together. So it's developed a culture of cooperation and collaboration among staff at our different institutions. And we really wanted an open and inclusive management structure. So all of the participants have got a completely equal voice in all of the decision making and in the development of the press. And our management boards are very engaged. Through them, we've got this constant kind of sense checking, uh, course setting, uh, and it's key to that sense of shared ownership that we are taking on board their different viewpoints and their different experiences, because they come from a wide range of different types of institution. So while we provide kind of central communication messages and materials, each institution is able to adapt them to their own local needs, and they are responsible for the promotion of the press within their own institutions. They do have some ownership there. They've also agreed that all uh, members will promote SUP books, regardless of the author's affiliation. And we're also really keen to look at the way we can maximize our position within institutions. So things like the potential to use library spaces for book launches, for example. They're also really keen to look at ways to involve students and we are scoping out the potential to offer placements for things such as uh, book cover design in the future. We then have our editorial board that's formed of 14 academic colleagues from across our member institutions. There are also two early career researchers on the board, and it's really great to have uh, input from the ECR perspective, and they're helping us look at how we can support ECRs more generally. And um, we also set up some mentoring sessions for them on peer review on request. Um, and another key role for the editorial board is advocacy. So raising awareness of SUP as a new press um, is really essential. So we created a, an advocacy toolkit for the editorial board, which includes approaches for promoting SUP across their networks 
and also just encouraging wider engagement with open access initiatives um, at institutions such as rights retention policies. So the toolkit covers messages about SUP and includes some simple advocacy actions um, and it's available on our website if anyone's interested. I'll see if I can post a link to the chat afterwards. We also have our peer review network so researchers can sign up to join the SUP to join this on the SUP website. And we use this network to source suitable reviewers for proposals. We've now had over 120 researchers sign up. And this is really good for us as we've got a pool to draw from, but it's also helping uh, encourage researchers to get involved with the press as well. So as you can see, we're really keen to involve all staff at our institutions. We are planning on running an anonymous feedback survey soon to try and capture some areas for improvement and just get a general sense of how SUP is being received by researchers. So the good and the bad, and that will help us develop our plans. So in order to support different areas of the press, we've established three SUP working groups. Um, the management board were really keen to involve a wide range of staff from our libraries. So membership is open to all, and we put out an open call to join. So staff are able to contribute to the development of SUP, but also are able to support their own personal development um, opportunities. So the training and development group, they recently delivered a training webinar for all library and researchers support staff across our institutions. And this went into lots of detail about how SUP works, all of our editorial processes and production workflows. And the aim was just to make sure that staff are all on the same page about SUP and are comfortable when discussing the press or answering questions from researchers. They also created a survey on the open access workforce landscape, which I'll discuss in just a moment. The research and policy group monitor the research and policy landscape and look at the kind of practical implications for SUP. So, for example, one of the things I looked at was um, the implementation of the UKRI policy for open access books. Then we have the communications group, which is another very practical group. They're looking at the development of the communication strategy, our communications materials, um, things like the website, blog posts and events. So, again, lots of opportunities for developing skills here. So the training and development group recently circulated a survey to all 18 member libraries, capturing um, the details of areas of work and institutions that are being affected by development and open access. So the purpose of the survey was to identify any training gaps that may exist at present or likely to emerge soon. What do we know about the impact of open access on staff workflows and roles? So some of the initial findings include that libraries are often the ones that take the lead on communi communicating open access developments across institutions, that a much wider knowledge and expertise around publishing practice, metrics, discoverability, research dissemination is now required, that the regrading of existing roles is quite common, acknowledging that roles have become much more complex in line with the open access environment, and also that a few new roles are being created, including a publishing librarian role at the University of Dundee that is being created specifically to support library-led publishing. Of course, there are lots of challenges as well. Um, some of the key ones that came out are the increasing workload for smaller teams, um, financial pressures, um, recruitment controls and freezes. These are definite issues. So the training and development group will now analyze the results in more detail and look at next steps, seeing what training needs there may be in the future. We're also working with some existing SCURL groups to develop in two specific areas. So we're working with the copyright and legal team to develop an online copyright tool for our authors to use to find out what they need to do with third party materials in their books. And this is based on an existing tool for staff um, that's aimed at using materials for learning and teaching. So it needs adapting to look at publishing. So it's a learning curve for this group as well. We're also working on our metadata workflows. We want to make sure that our books are very high quality metadata and are highly discoverable. And again, we can benefit here from our library expertise in this area. Oops, sorry. So our member libraries have agreed to take it in turns to catalogue our titles and provide mark records, starting with uh, St Andrew's Library. Uh, and we're also planning to use the TOTE open metadata uh, management platform to create and disseminate our metadata. So that's another kind of open infrastructure. And we're planning to work with the cataloging team at St Andrews to test the system. So again, this is going to involve new skills and training for the team there too. So I just want to quickly talk about the platform that the books will be published on. So we decided on a, a local rather than an outsourced option. So since 2018, SCURL has coordinated a shared hosting service for online books and journals for member libraries. And that's provided by the University of Edinburgh Library, specifically the team that work on Edinburgh Diamond there. So for a very reasonable hosting fee, 
staff set up um, a site using OJS or OMP. They provide ongoing technical support and training and offer general publishing guidance. Um, and all fees are invested straight back into the shared service. So this it fits in very well with that not-for-profit ethos and also gives us some good control over the future direction of the platform rather than relying on the third party. The shared service users also meet quarterly. We share our experiences and discuss ideas for improvement. And it's really great to be able to pool our knowledge. Uh, and linked into this, um, the Open Research Scotland group um, are looking to start an Open Research Scotland journal using the um, hosting service and OJS. And they're really keen to get staff and institutions involved with setting this up and joining the editorial board. So again, this is a really good way to improve staff skills when it comes to open access publishing. And then lastly, very quickly, uh, I want to talk about the rise in institutional open access publishers that we've seen in the last eight or nine years, just to show that SUP are not alone in what we're trying to achieve. And there's a much wider move towards more equitable publishing models. There's been a real a kind of new wave of institutional publishers who are trying to drive some change in the area. Uh, and you can see some of them on the slide here. And the fact the sector is growing at such a pace that in 2023, a group of these presses came together to form the Open Institutional Publishing Association. So that's a new community of practice aimed at not-for-profit UK institutional publishers who are born or striving for open access. And it's not just for presses, it's for hosting services or individual journals at institutions. And the group's looking at sharing our experiences, resources and best practice, fostering support, collaboration and networking opportunities, building partnerships with key players in the wider open access community, providing a collective voice for smaller institutionally affiliated publishers in the sector discussions, so making sure that we've got a voice, and also advocating for the expertise and the value of institutional open access publishing. So the group's now open for membership, and um, I'll post a link to the website in the chat. We um, recently won some innovation funding from UKSG, so we'll be holding a symposium on the future of institutional publishing in York on the 10th of June, and we'll be announcing more on that uh, very soon. So that's uh, the end of my talk, sorry if I've run over a bit, um, but I hope that I've shown that libraries can um, work at scale to deliver a high quality publishing solution. And I'll just stop sharing there, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Dominique. And just a, a really good exemplar, I think, of how we can put our values at, at the heart of our design, decision making, management structures when we're thinking through new enterprises and also keep that focus and attention on skills development when we're developing new strands of activity within our services as well. Um, I can already see some questions coming through, so please do keep them coming um, throughout the presentations. I will introduce now our second speaker, um, who is Neil Stern. Uh, Niels is the Managing Director of OAPEN and Co-Director of DOAB. He's worked in scholarly book publishing for more than 20 years and is a member of the Opera's Executive Assembly and the Vice Chair of the Open Book Collective, and also serves on a number of advisory boards and committees. So I'll hand over to you, Niels. Thank you very much, uh, Susie. And uh, good morning to you all from Denmark. I'm really happy to be here today to talk about how uh, our infrastructures for open scholarly book publishing can help uh, support uh, publishers and libraries and research funders, and also hopefully increase equity in open uh, book publishing. So first, uh, just a few words on the Open Library and uh, DOAB, Directory of Open Access Books. We share mission the mission of increasing discoverability of peer-reviewed open access books and also promoting and building trust in OA book publishing. We are, we are small, uh, independent, not-for-profit uh, organizations, uh, Dutch foundation, uh, foundations, so based in the Netherlands although I am uh, working from home in Denmark, we, uh, by Dutch law, cannot be sold or acquired. We are guided by the principles of open scholarly infrastructure and have performed our self-audit uh, last year. I should also mention that we operate the uh, uh, community-led um, open Access Books Toolkit, um, which was set up in 2020. It comprises... Uh, a lot of articles, small small articles about all sorts of um, topics related to OA book publishing. We have a large uh, open access, uh, a large editorial advisory board, uh, sort of representing uh, all stakeholders. So it's a free information resource that anyone can use. 
the open library was basically created as a project by a handful of university presses uh, almost 15 years ago uh, and then launched um, and uh, in 2010 then at the time of course the the library was intended for these university presses to share uh, their peer-reviewed open access books so peer review was um, a cornerstone for the library and open access of course and then it uh, after the project ended it opened up so that uh, any uh, publisher with peer reviewed uh, OE academic books could uh, join and many uh, many publishers have done that so we have several hundred publishers with over today 34000 uh, open access books we provide the hosting so the full text um, it can be any format that is compliant with DSpace, so PDF or EPUB or other formats. We then do the distribution, and we also do preservation. We work with Portico and Clocks. And um, one way that many libraries engage with our books are through library intermediaries like EBSCO, Ex Libris, OCLC. Of course, all <clears throat> books in OAPEN library can be accessed for free by anyone at any given time without uh, telling anyone so uh, there's an open api uh, all the metadata for uh, the metadata outputs are, are free to use but if uh, a library is using a, a library system like uh, elma for instance then uh, in the knowledge base of that library system OAPEN can be activated as a collection, and we see uh, really many, many libraries doing that. We get, uh, this is uh, from Clarivate, the the, um, the statistics we get back. And in overall, we see around 1.2 million counterconformant downloads from the OAPEN library per month. The OAB was uh, launched uh, 10 years ago, more or less, uh, as a project uh, from uh, coming out of OAPEN because we thought maybe some publishers would have their own hosting solution and only need an index. So making a reference back to where to find the book. And uh, the principles for joining DYB, this is a free to use service for publishers once they have been um, accepted. And, and we um, the criteria for acceptance are uh, the peer review policy, their license policy, it has to be an open license. And of course, their profile as academic publishers, uh, publishing um, monographs, edited collections, and other long form formats. Today, we have over 80,000 uh, titles in DYB, and all the metadata uh, is in public domain. Uh, we manage uh, DYB together with uh, Open Edition, uh, a French platform. And it's also based on DSpace repository, just like uh, Open. So just uh, in a nutshell, uh, you could say that DOAB aggregates aggregators of uh, book platforms uh, like OAPEN, like Open Edition, JSTOR, Project Muse, and so on. And of course, also a long range of smaller publishers. There are uh, over 650 publishers registered in DOAB. So uh, we have, but these platforms uh, uh, work with DOAB uh, on a trust-based level. So we have uh, what we call the DOAB Trusted Platform Network. And I'll talk a bit more about that later because it's it's a fairly new concept that um, gives us um, also ways in which to engage with a wider community um, across the globe. A final thing about uh, DOAB is uh, this service, which is the Peer Review Information Service for Monographs that was um, launched uh, a bit over a year ago. It provides publishers to give information about their peer review process. Uh, so not the peer review itself, but uh, how they uh, perform uh, the peer review. So they can give this information <clears throat> in a standardized way. And then we uh, capture the information in the metadata of the book so that anyone downstream can see uh, what the process has been for actually uh, for quality assurance. And um, many publishers do use this service, uh, but still it's only around 10% of the books in DYB that have this information. It's a free, for, a free to use service for, for publishers, but we do encourage using it to increase transparency around um, the quality assurance process. 
So in a nutshell, and in a very sort of schematic, uh, uh, simplified overview, this is uh, the machine room. This this is the way the infrastructures operate. So as mentioned, we work with uh, several hundred publishers. They provide us with metadata uh, in a variety of uh, Onyx uh, formats, I would say, or flavors, uh, versions. Uh, they give us the books. We, we capture them also in different ways. Then we normalize the metadata within uh, OAPEN. We push that downstream to search engines like Google Scholar and Paywall and many others, and also through the library aggregators, aggregators as mentioned. But also, importantly, anyone can get all the metadata and the books for free um, uh, bypassing any system, just taking directly what we have through our metadata feeds and through the Open API. And I also want to mention uh, what we announced uh, together with CERN uh, just uh, two weeks ago, namely that um, as of uh, the second quarter of this year, our servers will be moving to CERN. This is based on a new collaboration agreement on open access books between CERN and OAPEN. And I'm very happy to see uh, a big institution uh, uh, committed to open science like CERN uh, engaging with a very small uh, operation like OAPEN to help uh, make um, open science uh, also be considered as something very trustworthy, reliable, uh, that will be here for a long time. Okay, so now sort of focusing a bit on uh, on this uh, panel's topic of developing equitable, equitable knowledge infrastructures for, for open access books in our case, um, um, it's something that has uh, been on our minds for a couple of years, really how to make sure that the infrastructures that we provide are um, um, or support uh, equitable open publishing. Uh, we see that the usage of, of OAPEN and DOAB is, is really global. Uh, there's a lot of usage uh, on, on the reader side, but uh, do we see the same on the let's say the, the the publisher and and the author side so this is something we have been looking into uh, a bit more over the last two, one to two years and <clears throat> i will share with you like three challenges that we see in the open access book landscape and and some of the ways in which we are trying to to uh, address these challenges so the first challenge is really <clears throat> that when looking at the data uh, the, the the publishers in DOAB we see that there is um, um, a divide globally. So we see more Global North publishers, uh, publishers from Europe, North America, increasingly also uh, many publishers from uh, South America, but uh, Africa, Asian publishers, uh, there are less um, uh, from those regions. So what we have been thinking about is that we should do uh, more outreach. Um, we should make sure that if there are uh, publishers, publishing initiatives um, in Africa, in Asia, uh, that um, uh, can, uh, that that um, fulfill the requirements of DYB, of course, peer-reviewed open access books, that they should be aware that we have this uh, free-to-use service available to them. And uh, so we have uh, engaged in a project, the Open Book Futures project, which is uh, uh, sort of the second uh, coping project where we focus on this. We have also launched um, activities in Africa to, to reach out. Um, we have also through the DOAB Trusted Platform Network that I mentioned, um, enabled contact uh, through these platforms to um, many more publishers and engage with these platforms about how we can um, um, make uh, more use of uh, DOAB globally. And we have also considered uh, something like DOAJ has done uh, successfully, I think, namely an ambassadors program. Uh, this requires some, some seed funding that we haven't received, we haven't found yet, but that could be another way to, to also uh, promote uh, DOAB more globally. Uh, this is uh, an image from a workshop we did in Cape Town in, uh, together with the Open Book Futures project uh, back in February, where we saw delegates from 10, 12 uh, sub-Saharan countries really focusing on uh, core issues uh, relevant to that part of the world. And we are, of course, very happy to, um, to um, 
to engage and and, and find ways to make you the use of of DOAB relevant to to um, publishing initiatives in Africa. So the second challenge I would mention is that um, the quality assurance uh, and the peer review standards, of course, are of you know real important. That's how we curate our collections. Uh, but we should also respect the bibliodiversity. So really trying to see how can we nurture um, the scholarly community, especially in the humanities, with many small niche disciplines, also in countries where um, with languages that are not spoken by many. And uh, so try to understand and be sensitive to these cultural differences and to differences in in uh, in dis among disciplines. So again, um, we have just. Um, uh, planned and will uh, next month have um, a conversation between these trusted platforms plus a few more uh, organizations about peer review practices, evaluation criteria. How do we make sure that that we consider something like uh, bibliodiversity when we uh, evaluate uh, publishers across the globe? Uh, of course, it's also not only across the globe, it's also like internally in Europe, there are big differences between uh, Northwest, Southeast and, and so on. Um, we also should look at uh, the, the quality of DOAB. DOAB is increasingly becoming uh, a reference point for many institutions in their uh, open access um, uh, strategies. And uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe libraries can help us uh, sort of uh, monitoring the quality of uh, DOP. This is something we have been thinking about, and the, the toolkit is also a, a resource here to, to be considered. And finally, uh, the metadata quality, of course, is very important, uh, and also technical capacity. So we work with very small publishers. Sometimes it's just a few academics, and other uh, times it's it's uh, very, very large uh, Taylor and Francis size publishers and anything in between. But many of the new uh, uh, university presses or the new publishing initiatives, uh, they sometimes lack technical capacity and we'd like to help them and we like to encourage also libraries uh, to help them. Um, so Dominic just mentioned the uh, TOAD metadata management system, which is a nice tool, good uh, tool for, for uh, such initiatives to to use. Uh, the monograph press, which which Dominic also mentioned, is again a very uh, good tool for, for presses to use, which actually we are working on integration between OMP and DOAB and OAPEN. And uh, we can also see examples of how libraries can engage in this. We have a library working group where we have um, uh, help from libraries to uh, uh, clean and uh, make uh, uh, our metadata feeds uh, available in MARC uh, format. And we are very thankful, not only to this library working group, but also to all the libraries that support us, including uh, uh, 34 libraries in the UK. And, and without that support, we, we can't make uh, our, uh, the infrastructures uh, operational. So I'm, I'm aware of the time, so I'll just uh, just meet very briefly uh, towards the end, uh, just a couple of words, uh, if that's okay, Susie, with uh, on research funders. We're currently conducting a project for the European Commission, um, overseeing <clears throat> or understanding the landscape of uh, policy making across the Europe. We have collected data from 39 countries. We're building a knowledge base. It's available. We're connecting it to the toolkit. We'll come out with analysis uh, before summer and recommendations in the autumn. And we we are, we have established a funder forum where we um, uh, um, gather funders to discuss uh, open access for books. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and this, I think, is also a way of considering equity. Uh, UKRI, <clears throat> with their policy, has tried to uh, address Diamond OA as an alternative funding model. I think this is a very interesting uh, progress in, in funder policies. And as you will be aware, probably they have uh, come up with this opportunity to support a Diamond and non-BBC open access scheme. So this is a first step. I think many more steps will come, but it's just showing how uh, funders can also play a role and uh, with funders, we work uh, a lot. We have uh, collections that we work with for the, the funders you can see here where we do collection management, we do reporting, and and we uh, have done that for, for the last 10 years. So in conclusion, uh, from our point of view, um, things that are needed still 
uh, in this uh, landscape to solve some of the problems around equity is funding. It's uh, recognition of bibliodiversity, not one size fits all. We need to make sure that we support the scholarly uh, diversity uh, across disciplines and languages, geographies, and then we need to think of it in a global uh, in a global sense. So. Of course, again, from our point of view, supporting what we do is helpful, but also thinking about other initiatives out there that can support these um, this more equitable open publishing. And then, of course, the, the alignment of policies for funders, but also for publishers. And finally, uh, collaborative efforts through projects and, and partnerships are really important to us. Thank you very much, and sorry for running over. Not at all, Niels. We, we, we're, we're absolutely fine for time. And thank you for, for sharing with us both your successes, but also the reflecting that you're doing on, on the challenges. And it's an important reminder at, at an event like this with so many institutions and in so many countries present, just how we position that conversation in a global context. And I think some of your final thoughts will certainly want to pick up on um, in our discussion at the end. Uh, I'm going to introduce our third and our final speaker. So we have Francis Marsh, uh, Plant Sciences Librarian at the University of Cambridge, um, and Lucy Woolhouse, Genetics Librarian at the University of Cambridge. They're going to speak about a project which introduces technicians to the publication process and empowers them to recognise when their work should be credited. Thanks. Thanks, Susie. Uh, so yeah, hi everyone, I'm Frankie um, and this is my colleague Lucy, we're talking to you from Cambridge today. Um, we work in the Biological Sciences Libraries team at the University of Cambridge and we're going to share some of the results and reflections on the workshops that we've been developing on fair attribution and publishing for technicians. Um, so yeah, this session is all about equitable knowledge infrastructures and it's been really fascinating to hear from Dominique and Niels about infrastructure for open access book publishing. Um, Lucy and I are going to explore how we've been working around some of the barriers of the kind of um, research information systems like elements that we use at Cambridge, um, but how other tools like ORCID and the credit taxonomy can help make knowledge infrastructures more equitable. Um, but ultimately, we're going to talk about how uh, actually our kind of education led approach to making attribution fairer by empowering technicians with some of the knowledge and tools to change shared norms and practices. Um, so we're going to start by giving some background and context for de developing a workshop on fair attribution um, and give some detail about what we cover in the session itself. We'll give an overview of who attended the session reflect on how they went and then share some of our plans for the future as well. Um, so yeah, firstly, how did this idea come about? Well, Frankie was actually in a departmental meeting um, for professional services staff within the plant sciences department when the topic of career progression and staff retention was raised. And some technicians as part of this started discussing their varied experiences of being acknowledged or given a co-author credit in papers. Frankie immediately thought this was something that we could help with um, as, as part of our team in biological sciences, and so brought the idea back to us. Um, once we started looking into it, we could see that this was an area that was not being covered elsewhere in the university. There is currently no standard practice in Cambridge for crediting the role of technicians in research, uh, who therefore experience great disparity in their recognition and visibility in the scholarly outputs that come from Cambridge. We also found loads of training um, that on, on sort of, you know, a variety of areas that was directed at students, researchers and general professional services staff, but not very much at all that was um, aimed directly at technicians. So as part of our research, we became aware that Cambridge uh, was a founding signatory of the Technician Commitment, which is an initiative that aims to ensure visibility, recognition, career development and sustainability for technicians across the UK landscape. We made contact with the Technician Commitment Coordinator within the university, who really liked the idea of this kind of training being available and gave us a lot of insight into the varied roles of technicians across the institution. 
It also fitted really well into the visibility and recognition themes and would help to push forward some of the work that he had already been doing in this area. So it was great to have his support throughout this process. Additionally, technicians are increasingly being recognized as a vital part of the research process within the wider higher education sector. The recently released initial decisions report for the next REF emphasizes team research and heightening the visibility of research enabling staff. And technicians are also being consulted about being included more heavily in the next people, culture and environment section for the submission. Funders like UKRI and in particular BBSRC are also encouraging technicians to apply for grants themselves and for PIs to include technicians in their grant proposals. Therefore, it seems technicians are inevitably going to be more involved in the outputs of research from those grants in particular, and might even be publishing themselves. Next slide, please, Frankie. <laughs> so after all this background research and consultation, we came to the conclusion that since we already train students and researchers on lots of these issues around the publication process and tools to help with recognition, why not extend similar training to the technician community? It sounds like technicians are going to be expected to participate in these areas, so they will need to know about them, and libraries are perfectly placed to help with this. Um, so we knew we couldn't fix all of these kind of really big issues of research culture ourselves, but we were keen to do something. Um, and so our starting point was to think about adapting the content of our library's core research support training for a new audience. Um, initially, we thought about a session on ORCID as a tool to engage technicians with this idea of attribution. But this really grew as we spoke to technicians and thought about their requirements. Having now run pilot sessions online and in person for the School of Biological Sciences, um, a workshop at the university's first professional services conference for technicians across the university, and most recently a tailored session for all of the technicians in the Crop Science Centre, we've eventually settled on a good structure for an in-person 90-minute workshop that aims to help start conversations about more equitable practices for authorship and acknowledgement. Um, we introduced the basics of scholarly communications in the UK higher education sector, including this um, pressure to publish for academics. Um, and we also talk about the open access landscape. We do explain what ORCID is and uh, encourage participants to sign up for an ID there and then uh, with a kind of live demo. Um, we discuss the differences between acknowledgement and authorship. Um, but then a good proportion of the session is um, discussion in small groups with guided questions about their experiences of fair attribution. Um, and then after kind of feeding back from that discussion, we introduce the credit taxonomy to show how technicians work fits the expanding definition of authorship. Um, and we finish with some tips on how to have conversations about these topics with their PIs or line managers. So as Frankie said, over the last six months, we've delivered this session four times to a variety of participants uh, with a total of 43 attendees overall. Um, while three out of the four sessions were aimed directly at biological sciences technicians, the session we ran as part of the professional services conference did attract a much wider audience. In fact, um, we've managed to reach four out of the six uh, schools that exist within Cambridge. Um, only missing arts and humanities and physical sciences. Uh, understandably, biological sciences have been the biggest audience, closely followed by clinical medicine, but we've also had interest from social sciences and even from technicians based within the university library. So this indicates that the session has a wide appeal for technicians across the university. So one thing we were interested in looking at was the job titles of the people who attended our sessions. Technicians, like librarians, have widely varying roles depending on the area that they work in. As part of the advertising for the session, we did stress that you didn't have to have the word technician in your job title in order to come along, as we were interested in the experience of anyone who identified as a technician. So while you can see that the most common job title of our attendees was research laboratory technician, 
Other common titles included microscopy specialist and lab manager. And we had a good range of grades represented as well, right the way um, from the sort of uh, high echelons of biological microscopy coordinator all the way down to uh, apprentice. Um, so we think the workshops have been really successful. Everyone who filled out a feedback form said that they would recommend the session. Some noted that the opportunity to network with other technicians was really valuable. And for this reason, the workshops did work best in person. Participants really seized on the chance to share their experiences. So we needed to extend the timings from uh, our initial one hour to 90 minutes. Um, and then from these quotes, I think it's clear that lots of technicians are being acknowledged and given authorship, but there is no consistency of approach. So some participants shared their frustration at the lack of recognition for their work, um, the dismissive response if they raised the issue, and others noted that technicians often don't even know that they're recognised in a publication. Um, on the other hand, the majority of participants did say that they had some experience of acknowledgement or attribution, and some uh, reported a supportive, positive experience. I think it was um, particularly interesting to note the difference between lab technicians who are integrated in a research group compared to core facilities staff who run services for things like um, microscopy and proteomics. Many of these core facilities do actually have um, a policy or kind of service agreement in place for acknowledging the facility and individual staff members, but they've got no oversight of whether this happens in practice or methods of following it up if it doesn't. Um, so I think overall this participant quote sums it up. Involvement in publications greatly depends on the people we are working with. Some are more receptive and keen to involve technical staff in the conversation about the research. Um, and we think it's clear, therefore, that there is a need for some kind of university level guidelines similar to those already in place at other RLUK member institutions like um, Liverpool and Southampton. So engaging directly with technicians for this work has also highlighted the need to develop more equitable systems approaches to track contributions of everyone involved in research, not just those on academic contracts. So what is next in this project? Uh, we are currently working on a plan to make the session more widely available for technicians across the whole university, rather than just within our sort of section of biological sciences. Uh, we do have two more sessions planned for this academic year so far, which we've opened up to observers from across Cambridge University libraries as a whole, as that's all the libraries that exist um, within Cambridge, um, so that other librarians and research support professionals can experience the session and hopefully begin to run it in their own areas. Um, we are quite conscious that any expansion of this session needs to be sustainable. Um, you know, we are just two people and we have you know, full-time jobs. Um, so uh, recruiting more people able to deliver this session is essential across the university. And then another thing that's been really rewarding about working on this project has been the chance it's given us to meet and collaborate with new people from across the university, from the Technician Commitment Coordinator to people in the Office of Scholarly Communication and the Research Strategy Office. It really has been a convergence of different people working towards similar goals. As part of this, our work on the session and the feedback from the participants have been informing the guidance on fair attribution being drafted by the Technician Commitment Coordinator and providing evidence for the importance of having such guidance in place. This is now making its way through the various university committees, as well as being consulted on by technicians and has recently been solidified as part of the Cambridge, Cambridge's Technician Commitment Action Plan for the next few years. While we can't claim any credit for actually drafting the guidelines, um, our work has helped to raise these issues more widely and ensure technicians' voices are being heard as part of the process. So when thinking about progressing this project further, we also came up with some potential challenges that we wanted to share with you today. Um, so if you have the answers to any of these, please do let us know, um, either after the session or, um, you know, in the in the sort of Q&A. 
so firstly, technicians, as we've mentioned already, technicians often aren't told when they're acknowledged and acknowledgements aren't indexed or discoverable in the same way that co-author credits are. Given the potential future importance of this data for funders and ref reporting, how can we begin to log it accurately? There's also a danger of focusing too much on STEM and leaving out those working in technician roles across uh, humanities, arts and social sciences. We need to do more work ourselves around ensuring that this session is either applicable to all or tailored for the different groups. But it can be difficult to sum up the collective technician experience when jobs do vary so wildly. Um, additionally, research infrastructure um, can create barriers to inclusion. Um, we've heard quite a lot about sort of research infrastructure and, and Frankie touched on this at the beginning of our talk. Um, but yeah, one example from Cambridge specifically is that uh, technicians are not automatically given uh, accounts to be able to deposit into our repository through uh, our elements tool in the same way that researchers are. So again, if we, if technicians are going to become more part of this, uh, this sort of uh, research output and publication process, does that need to change? And finally, um, despite or because of <laughs> the barriers posed by systems and infrastructure, we are keen to continue this, uh, taking this education led approach, empowering technicians to understand when they should be credited and giving them the tools to do so. But ultimately, power structures do still exist. And what we found is that technicians experiences are dependent on the PIs and other academics that they work with. Until researchers themselves understand the changing nature of authorship and embrace tools like the credit taxonomy, the situation is unlikely to change. Hopefully having some guidelines in place in Cambridge will help with this. But should we also be thinking about how to train the academics on these issues and not just the technicians? Uh, so yeah, that brings us to the end of our talk. Thank you so much for listening. Um, we're happy to answer any questions and hear your thoughts now, but would also be really pleased if you wanted to get in touch with us after today, whether that's because your library has also been involved in implementing fair attribution guidelines, or you're thinking about doing something similar. Um, we are going to uh, release the slides that we use in our teaching under a CC BY license, um, which they're not ready quite yet, but hopefully will be soon. Um, and we've got a few references on this final slide, but I will stop sharing now. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, that was very interesting. And that one's very dear to my heart because it's a, a live conversation at Bristol about how we raise the, the, the visibility um, and recognition for all contributions to research um, and to shift that narrative around re a researcher being somebody on particular terms and conditions um, to, it's an important discussion. Can, can I now invite all of our presenters to reappear and uh, unmute and I will move us into our Q&A session. I have been given permission by um, our RLUK organisers to overrun slightly because we have a, a quite a long break, I think, after this particular session. Um, so we will see how we get on with uh, some of the questions we have for us. Um, I'm just going to start this. This this feels like quite um, a, a straightforward question, but I suppose is is a is a jumping off point for for a kind of larger a larger question. So um, I think in your um, presentation, Dominique, you mentioned your work with early career researchers (ECRs). Um, and there's a question about how, how you define uh, an ECR, which might be an easier one to answer in a particular context. But I also wonder generally what, what the role is of, of early career professionals in, in terms of transforming a lot of the scholarly communications um, landscape, but challenging some of those traditional models, I suppose, um, that we've, we've been talking about this morning. So I'll, I'll pass on to you, Dominique, first for that, for that particular question, and, and then if others have thoughts. Um... Yeah, so, um, yeah, so the definition first of the ECR, that was actually quite a, a tricky thing to come to, because there are lots of different definitions of what an ECR is. 
Um, so we saw some that are kind of within 10 years of being awarded their PhD and then some um, awards are only for those within three years of their PhD. Um, and also, you know, it's not always a kind of linear career as well anymore. You know, you may have people that have lots of background in research that might be classed as an early career researcher. So we kind of went with the kind of UKRI definition, which is it within eight years of um, your PhD. But we also were kind of quite keen for it to be self-defined. So as well, rather than being really strict with with kind of a set number of years. Um, so I hope that opens that part. And yeah, we've been really keen to get early career researchers involved with the press. I think just being given more of an opportunity, I think they can be very good advocates for um, for open access, very um, kind of keen and can speak within their own networks. Um, also keen, I think some of the more institutional um, run presses do have kind of schemes in place for ECRs. I think there's one, one being we released recently is the Trailblazers one at um, Salford, and I can't remember is it Lancaster. Sorry, I'm terrible, <laughs> but I know that that's something that we've been thinking about at, at SEP is how can we make um, it easier for ECRs to publish their first book, and it's been really important kind of having the ECLs on the board so that we can work with them, find out their experiences. Um, but also we're thinking about doing, we're almost doing surveys, but doing another survey for ECLs or institutions to see what SEP could do um, to improve um, things for them in this area. Um, but I don't know if anybody else, it is style for Lancaster and Liverpool. Thank you, sorry. <laughs> Thank I you, Martin. completely <laughs> forgot who we got. Um, but I think that's a really great initiative, giving um, ECLs more of an opportunity to get their kind of PhD published, for example. Uh, it's a really good initiative. I don't know if anybody else wants to come in before I um I move on to another question. Uh, there's one here around um research advocacy, sort of beyond the, the walls of our institutions, I suppose, um, looking at uh public libraries. Um, again, I think specifically asked as in the context of SUP, Dominique, but yeah. um, you know, it's, it's a good question, isn't it, about how the, how the benefits of what we're doing extend uh, beyond um, just higher education. Yeah, definitely. It's um, not something we've got on our, our kind of project plan. It's not something we've investigated yet. But we do have a good, really good relationship with with SILIP Scotland. Um, SCURL have good re working relationship with them. So that could be something that we we do scope out, um, something that we could work through with them. Um, we've definitely heard from um, our researchers and our authors um, so far that they are very keen to reach that wider audience. And actually, especially reaching practitioners, so a couple of the titles that we're working on do have contributions from practitioners uh, who don't have access to institutional subscriptions. So, yeah, that's been something that people are quite keen on when I've been doing stalls about SEP and researchers have been talking to me is, yeah, they are keen to reach that wider audience. So um, working with public libraries is a really good idea, but yeah, not, not something we've looked into in depth yet. So I'd be interested to hear if anybody else has looked into this area. Maybe maybe I could just add one little thing. We <clears throat> in uh, in the U.S. we have worked with uh, New York University and Lyricist to um, share the the books in the Open Library through an app they have created uh, called the uh, the Palace Project. It's called the Palace Project. So they basically provide uh, books that are licensed or for free uh, across public libraries in the US. And so really we're eager to to get the open books onto that app. So that works quite nicely and it's a way of reaching a much wider audience, of course. Yes, it's increasingly, I think, um uh it's becoming more of a priority isn't it thinking about how how we can support but also what we can learn from them from the public library sector and just one final question uh, uh for you dominique around the, that publishing librarian role yes. that you mentioned i think there's some curiosity about about what that role looks like and, and what it does yeah absolutely and i'm, I'm glad i had a little bit of time pre to prepare so i could go back to the job descriptions to remind myself as well um so yeah that was a role that was recently advertised um and it really is to support library-led publishing and 
kind of more non-traditional dissemination of research um, to wider audiences. So um, the, the role will kind of develop services <clears throat> that support academics to embed research dissemination strategies through their research projects, making sure that they're giving consideration to open access, non-traditional routes of publication, data transparency, uh, public engagement, um, yeah, as uh, relevant factors in kind of extending um, and reputable reach for, for research outputs. So they'll be doing things like creating training um, to promote the optimization of metadata, the application of DOIs and ISBNs, uh, technical opportunities as well for increasing reach um, through alternative publishing routes. So lots of different parts there, but I thought that was a really interesting role to see because I don't think I'd seen a role quite like that before. Um, so yeah, I'm really, and part of their role is going to be helping with SEP as well. So I'm absolutely delighted to have somebody else who will be um, working on SEP too. So. So, yeah, I thought that was a really interesting role and just goes to show the new kind of skills that are, are required in our in our sector. Um, yeah, I just seen Siobhan in the chat saying about her role, sorry. Um, oh, that's great. Oh, well, we'll have to put you in touch, <laughs> Siobhan. Definitely. It's, a, it's interesting, that balance, isn't it, between what's new skills and what's actually transferable into new context or building upon or ampl amplifying what we might think of as sort of traditional information professional roles. Um, and that role to me sounds like a real mixture of the two. Um, yeah, interesting. And we have some some questions um, and for Frankie and Lucy, um, I suppose they refer back to perhaps one of one of the very last things you were talking about in your presentation, which was uh, whether you got any pushback uh, from perhaps more established uh, members of uh, you know, the academic department you've been working with in terms of taking this in, this inclusive uh, approach towards accredi accrediting um, different contributions. <laughs> Would you like to take this, Lucy, or shall I? Uh, I think, yeah, so it's actually, we've sort of sidestepped that issue slightly <laughs> by um, by uh, addressing all of this directly at the technicians um, rather than, rather than yeah, like have going sort of through the academics to start with. So, yeah, the idea is that because that, you know, the the sort of mechanisms to to enable um, this to happen consistently don't exist within Cambridge yet um yeah our idea was to just educate the technicians about these issues so that they feel more confident raising them um if and when they feel that they apply uh in their situation so that's why we introduced tools like uh the credit taxonomy which is increasingly being used by publishers um uh to to encourage uh, people who are submitting papers to to put put people into those categories. Um, I think as part of the advocacy we've been doing for it, we've also been raising this within our departments and library committees. But that is a a newer piece of work that is happening. Um, so yeah, um, I don't know if you want to add anything, Frankie. No, not really. Just that, like from the feedback from technicians in the sessions themselves, it's clear that some faculty and academics are really supportive of technicians getting credited um, and you know being listed as co-authors on on publications where appropriate but it the practice really does vary and there have also been you know people who've who've asked for, for credit and received an outright no um, and you know the the conversation has ended so um it, like practice does does vary quite quite a lot Hopefully that answers the question. It does, yeah. And in, in terms of the expansion of that work, um, are you aware of or um, involved in conversations about or hopeful of more central university training, um, which emphasises credit taxonomy um, and, and, and makes it it's, it's easier for technicians to, to get that recognition? Um, we're, we're definitely trying to uh, kind of centralise this training that we're offering to technicians, um, as we mentioned in the talk, kind of expanding it beyond just the biological, the School of Biological Sciences um, out to the other schools across the university. Um, and, 
yeah, the credit taxonomy is, is obviously a part of, of that training that we're offering to technicians. Um, I think it would be great if, uh, you know, we kind of have a look at where else, uh, like advocating for, for using this credit taxonomy um, to really emphasize, you know, equitable research cultures um, amongst uh, academics and, and uh, early career researchers, postgrads, postdocs, you know, um, like where else we can promote the credit taxonomy. I think people do come across it because it is used widely by publishers, um, but actually thinking about how it can apply and, and in particular to, to recognizing technicians, but also other, uh, you know, potentially junior members of, of a lab, PhD students, um, you know, recognizing everybody in a more equitable way um, would be really, really nice. So yeah, that's definitely something that we could think about doing. I don't know if you have yeah, we've, we've had conversations about um, trying to incorporate some of this in sessions that we run for researchers about uh, writing for publication, for example. Um, so, it, so it is sort of raised at that sort of early stage as well. Um, and yeah, the conversations we've had with the research strategy office as part of the the sort of fair attribution guidelines conversation, um, they hadn't heard of the credit taxonomy. So we sort of raised that with them and um, they are uh, they're aware that the general authorship guidelines for Cambridge also need um, some revising. So it's possible that hopefully that will happen at the same time as the fair attribution guidelines so that they can, you know, um, work together which will be nice and, and how about librarians have you had much interest from librarians I'm, I'm just thinking of um the RNUK commitment to the technicians commitment and those um AHRC RNUK professional practice uh fellows um and the research uh catalyst cohort is, is it is it something from from among your colleagues where you're seeing interest and and and, and identification with that idea of a technician um, I'm not sure about the like identification with the role of technician for librarians themselves. We've we've actually had um, participants from the university library who are in roles um, at the, uh, the cultural heritage imaging lab, um, which does kind of photography uh, and and digitization. Um, so we we have had library staff come along to the sessions. Um, and, and found it really useful to think about where, where they should be credited and acknowledged for their work within the scholarly outputs that, that, uh, that they're supporting, basically. Um, I think there's also uh, relevance for librarians who um, support kind of systematic reviews, that, that side of things. I think that's, um, that's also relevant. Um, but yeah, this, uh, you know, the, the professional practice fellowships and um research catalyst cohorts like definitely we're seeing more librarians in roles that where they're directly uh involved in research and and you know co-authors and and co-pis um themselves so i think yeah librarians should definitely uh be aware and uh feel like this is relevant for them as well yeah i think one of the things um with our conversations that we've had with various people involved in technicians around uh, technician support around Cambridge is is, is a, a more of a recognition that librarians do actually fall into that that category um just through us doing this work which has been quite nice as well um and uh yeah I think um yeah the fair attribution guidelines I think the idea is that it won't just be for technicians it will be for any staff who are involved in supporting research um so yeah that would include librarians if they fall into that role as well i wonder dominique or niels whether you uh have come across this this uh role within uh the organizations institutions you you've been working with that that broadening of the concept of who's doing research and how we can uh, involve other research professionals equitably
Yeah, it's certainly something I've heard of, um, especially through the, I think, the Open Research Scotland group that I mentioned, which is a kind of um, a group that brings together lots of people who work in the kind of research uh, side um, in Scotland. But it's just not something that I um, do know a lot about, but obviously need to learn, <laughs> need to learn about. Um, and as we're in the very early stages of the press, actually, it is something um, that we should probably have on our agenda is thinking about the roles of the roles of, of librarians and technicians and, and into research. So, yeah. It's really good to hear about what's been going on. I, I think, in, I mean, in book publishing, uh, you would yeah. be familiar with, you know, a page of acknowledgement and, and you would thank all the people who have actually supported uh, your work. Uh, but uh, becoming part of the metadata, so uh, as a contributor, is probably less uh, common. Although, I mean, technical support can be many things. So <laughs> I once came across uh, a very, uh, a quite distinguished old author who was writing about uh, uh, classical philology and uh, still writing in hand, by hand, right? So he had someone actually typing. That's a kind of technician. <laughs> I know that's very uh, low practical, but uh, absolutely being uh, acknowledged. So I, I think uh, acknowledgements generally are, are something that, that are present, but not in a, in a systematized way, probably. So, yeah. I think it's exciting work. A question for you, Niels. Um, can you say something as to the extent of that shift that you see happening from commercial publishing to open access approaches? There's the, the, the person asking the question is hopefully asking for a percentage indication. I don't know whether that's possible or whether you could just speak about it in broader terms. Well, it depends on whether the sun is shining, I guess. <laughs> How optimistic you want to be. But I, yeah, it's a great question. I would, um, first of all, I, I think we should, uh, of course, be be mindful that that uh, open access and commercial doesn't have to be, you know, uh, against each other. So we you see a lot of commercial publishers uh, engaging in, in open access. But as, as you, I understand also this question about, you know, what is the percentage of the total number of book published uh, being OA, and it is still a fairly low number. Uh, so I, I would say, I mean, between maybe eight to ten percent, probably of the total outcome. But it's it's quite rapidly increasing. Um, last year, Delta Think did an analysis based on DOAB data showing that there is an annual annualized growth rate of uh, around thirty five percent for open access books, which is higher than for open access journals. Of course, it starts at a lower uh, level, but it shows a lot of uh, activity in the field. And I think you can see from all the different experiments on the publisher side that, you know, uh, I think uh, we've seen uh, models, MIT Press, Michigan Press in Europe, uh, what Dominique showed, the Open Book Collective as a, as a great model to encourage um, routes to open access that are not based on BPCs, which seems to be the preferred method of commercial publishers. So I think if if these models are successful, and that, of course, to a large extent depends on whether libraries, institutions want to support them, then we can see more rapid growth. And, uh, and then um, I think there is, it can happen quite quickly, actually. Um, but it's it's still a, a smaller part, and of course, DOAB is not the full set of everything published open access. Although it's it's a, a comprehensive uh, um, index, so so uh, finding out these numbers is is actually something we have struggled with a lot. And uh, the the project I mentioned, Palomira, has a part of that project is also about uh, addressing the issue of of getting uh, good data on on uh, good quantitative data. Yes, very difficult. I would have thought to to uh, arrive at at a, a number that you feel um, really represents all of the activity that's happening in this space. And it was great on on your last slide, Dominique, to see that flourishing of uh, different models, different presses, and some library presses yeah. as well. Yeah, exactly. We're really keen to kind of harness the power of collaboration through that as well. Um, of all the different UK institution-led presses and um, working together. Um, and one of our key areas um, that we're actually, we've got a kind of working group that we're going to start on is advocacy within institutions for this type of publishing. Um, because it, was, it is quite hard, you know, to to kind of, well, it's okay, I suppose for SUP, we're within the institutions, but 
yeah, getting to that kind of top level of management, getting our message heard, getting it across, um, that's definitely one of the big challenges. So um, I mentioned that we've kind of tried to do this advocacy toolkit within SUP, but it is, it's tricky, I think, because a lot of researchers um, are still keen to publish with kind of their preferred publisher. And so changing that is um, one of the things that we are looking at and what we can do together to uh, to change it. So um, I think one of the things we're going to do with OIPA is we're going to kind of create a web page that, that shows them what we can offer. You know, we're really trying to highlight, you know, kind of a lot of our books are award winning, for example, you know, we're trying to highlight these things, get that message out at institutions. So yeah, hopefully working together will speed things up, I hope. <laughs> Yeah, that, I think that's a that great note for us to finish on. The more activity, the more people involved, the more um, opportunities there are. 